what Pierre asked me to talk about tonight, you can tell that because um, it says Patrick Hoverstadt and Lucy Lowe that um, it hasn't been crafted specially for this. Um, what Pierre asked me to talk about was um, mainly our approach to doing strategy and how that might relate to thinking about it in an agile kind of way. Um, uh, we've got quite a long time, but I've got a ridiculous amount of stuff to talk about, but um, I don't have to talk about all of it. So um, butt in at any point, ask questions or stop and make comments or whatever. Um, so just, just, you know, don't feel shy and just pile in, you know. This is a little bit about us. So uh, we're consultants. Um, we do stuff around strategy, a lot of work around organization design and around change. We do it for a very wide range of, of types of organization. Um, all of that, we come at from a systems theory and a management science background. So we come at it from a a kind of different place to, to, to most consultancies in a way. And um, if you guys are, are, you know, I'm guessing most of you, if not all of you, come from the kind of agile camp. Um, it's kind of mm, next stable or two stables over, possibly, um, where we're coming from and, and, and where you're coming from. So I think there's hopefully enough um, common ground for us to, to have a decent conversation about it. Um, one of the things about this is that um, we don't, as a consultancy, we don't sell at all. And all the work comes from word of mouth. And in order to get word of mouth work, you have to basically not screw up. So if you screw up, um, you don't get recommended and, and, you don't, and the client doesn't come back. And for strategy, that was a bit of a problem. So we kept the, the reason we developed the approach I'm going to take you through was because um, clients kept asking us to do strategy and none of the strategy stuff that we knew about before we developed this actually worked, which meant that if we did it, we'd lose clients. So partly it was a, it was kind of as, as, as a result of that dilemma that we, we developed the approach I'm going to take you through. So just going back a bit into the theory around um, conventional strategy, and, and there's, there's kind of, um, there's two big schools of thought around this. One is, one is the, the, the sort of major one is around seeing strategy as what Henry Mintzberg described as deliberate strategy, as kind of strategy as intent. And on the other side, you've got, what Mintzberg described as emergent strategy. So the view of, of strategy, deliberate strategy is that strategy is about what we intend to do. And the view of emergent strategy is strategy as a direction for the organization that just kind of emerges. Um, so in the deli deliberate strategy bit, there's, there's kind of two ways of looking at it. One is outside in. So broadly speaking you start with an understanding of what what the world looks like outside basically look at the market and you do some models of that typically you do two by two matrices because everybody likes those because obviously that's the way you know the world always divides up into four boxes doesn't it um and always the the, the most important box the box to be in is the top right hand corner box you know so there's a bunch of approaches that are built around um, outside in. And then there's a bunch of approaches that are built around inside out. So the market led ones, the outside in one goes, where's a nice place for us to play? Let's go and play there. And the capability, the inside out ones um, start with what are we good at? Where would be a good place for somebody who's good at what we're good at to play? Obviously, um, again, you know, loads and loads of two by two matrices, um, because it's not like strategies are a, a difficult concept. So, you know, um, four options is quite enough for anybody, isn't it? And again, it's you, you do pin the tail on the donkey. You know, you've got to, you've got to get the get got to hit the top right hand corner. Um, so there's loads of tooling on that side. On the emergent strategy side, beyond Henry Mintzberg pointing out that most strategy is actually emergent, um, admit Scott, um, beyond 
you know, Henry saying, yeah, most strategies emergent. There are, up till us developing this, there was no tooling in the emergent strategy space. There was, Mintzberg did, um, most strategy is not deliberate, most of it's emergent, but he didn't explain how it emerged or what you could do about it. So it was a bit of an empty field. Um, and partly that's, that's kind of what we wanted to, to, to address with this. The problem with the deliberate strategy stuff where there is lots of tooling is that it doesn't work. So depending on which survey you listen to, something like 70% to 98% of strategic plans never get implemented. Um, and 70% is the most optimistic I've seen. 98 came from Russ Akoff. And it kind of doesn't really matter if it's 70% or 90%, which is a Kaplan and Norton figure, or 98%, which is a Russ Akoff figure. Anything above 50% means that there's something pretty fundamentally wrong with the approach. It's not like we can say, oh, well, it's, we got it a bit wrong that time. Let's just tweak it. If it fails anything approaching that level, it's not a tweak. It's it's we got the wrong idea basically. And of course, from a from a deliberate versus emergent strategy point of view, that means that somewhere between, you know, you reverse the figures, ninety eight percent and seventy percent of all strategy is emergent. It isn't what we d deliberately intended, you know. Um. So not having some tooling in that space of where everybody's going is, is a bit of a problem, I would say. Whichever you'd look at from a conventional strategy point of view, whether it's the outside on or the inside out, um, there's a kind of dominant narrative, which is this, that strategy is about, and it's a journey narrative, you know, it's about uh, where we are, where we want to get to and drawing a straight line from A to B. Um, and that's great as a way of planning a trip to the seaside. Um, it is less great um, in developing a strategy. And there's a fundamental difference between planning a trip to the seaside, thinking about this in, in kind of spatial terms, that, that thinking about strategies from point A to point B and the journey metaphor and the reality of strategy, because if I'm planning a trip to the seaside, the seaside does actually exist as a place now, whereas our strategic destination is somewhere in the future and it does not exist. So it's, you know, the metaphor kind of breaks down. It is like we've got to create where we end up. Part of the reason why this breaks down is, is pretty obvious when you think about it systemically, which is that there are there are almost no strategic situations in which there aren't other organizations playing. And conventional strategy pretty much totally ignores what everybody else is doing. So it is, you know, all the deliberate strategy stuff is very much about us and what we want. So you end up with these, I mean, you must have seen them, these crazy strategy documents that say we wouldn't need to be one number one in the world or something. And then, then you put in a load of pillars and somehow it looks like a Greek temple. You know, if we improve our people and our processes and our technology, we will be not. Yeah. Right. I mean, like that happens all the time, doesn't it? So, you know, basically most, well, all conventional strategy approaches ignore what all the other players are doing. And if you think about, even in journey terms, you know, trying to drive down the road in in the way we are taught to do conventional strategy, which is ig ignoring what everybody else does, you kind of wouldn't get very far. So on, under the influence of those other organizations, the target moves, we end up having to steer around car crashes with, with other organizations. And we end up going somewhere that we hadn't planned initially by a route that we hadn't planned initially and the tendency then is to kind of post post rationalize where we got to and say yeah yeah that's that's kind of where i ended intended to end up you know um two years ago pierre didn't intend ending up in zurich it's it's a it's a set of circumstances that have, have led him to end up where he where he has yeah true 
and this is this is true for Pierre. It, it's it's true for for organisations too. So you know there are some very obvious reasons why conventional stuff doesn't work. For us though, there was a, there was a kind of deeper question, um, which is a kind of more philosophical one, which is if if around 90%, and this is the Kaplan and Norton, the balanced scorecard people, their number, and I mean, they're about as conventional as, you know, as sort of sober suited as you could wish. You'd never see Kaplan and Norton in a, in a pink hoodie, you know. Um, if most of the time the strategic plans are never implemented, and yet the world is changing all the time, which obvious, very, very obviously it is. The question we were interested in is what the hell's going on? What is it that's driving the changes? Because if it's not the strategy, and it can't be because that's not what's getting implemented, what is driving the changes? And that's a kind of non-obvious question. And in systems, there's a very long tradition of um, looking across into biology and where we went was to the work of a Chilean biologist, Umberto Maturana. And his, he was interested in how organisms, how species evolve. And the model that he developed was called structural coupling. And it's a really, really simple idea. It is that an organism is coupled to its environment in such a way that the environment changes the organism structurally, which is why it's called structural coupling, and the organism changes the environment structurally. So the hummingbird beak evolves to fit the flower and the flower evolves to fit the hummingbird's beak. And through time, the two adapt, co-evolve to fit one another. And what you see with this is that the direction that each goes in is set by lots and lots and lots of adaptations between Two, uh, two entities, the organism and its environment. So we'd looked at transferring this into the world of organization. And this was scarily easy at a sort of concept level. Um, and also we found incredibly powerful. As soon as we started doing this, we could see this in action all over the place. So we could see this happening all the time. And just like the um, the birds and their beak. So so the bird's beaks thing is a, is a reference in a way back to Darwin. Uh, so Darwin's theory of evolution was based on looking at um, finches in the Galapagos and seeing that their beaks had evolved differently. The species had evolved like that. Um, just like birds and their beaks, there is no one single answer. So in conventional strategy, if you take a deliberate strategy view, there's basically two strategies you can go that win. Anyway, this is the Porter view of life, Michael Porter view of life. You can either go high end and charge a, a shed load of money, or you can go dead, dead cheap, um, pilot high and sell it cheap. Those are the two ways to win strategically. What we find using this approach is there are loads and loads and loads of way for organizations to win. Um, there is no one right answer. It is all context dependent. And there are always, almost always, multiple options that you can you can use. I can think of one, we've probably done this with, I don't know, about 100 organizations. I can think of one instance where there was only one way for them to get out of the, the, the problem that we're in. But that's that's you know incredibly rare, really. So, the idea of structural coupling, in a way, is that um, we're looking at the every structural coupling relationship has a natural trajectory. Um, we're looking at that that sort of dynamic that it creates. So, we're in a structural coupling. We're in a relationship, and that presents us with particular opportunities and challenges and we take a step forward in relation to the in response to those opportunities and challenges and as we move take a step forward it presents us with more opportunities and more challenges and we take another step forward and another step forward and another step forward 
and it looks like it's conscious choice and in a way it is um but actually the options that we're looking at and that are available to us are constrained by and determined by the relationships we're in by and large now occasionally you kind of look back and you think yeah back there there was a fork in the road and rather than taking the obvious path we could have gone that other way but mostly we don't mostly we take the obvious path and there are whole schools of strategy that are based on take the obvious path so if any of you have read um Richard Rummelt's um, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. Um, he talks about proximate action. And the proximate action is the, ob the obvious next step, you know? So it's not really what we're getting at. I mean, a, this is quite a big thing, I think. And it is goes back to that sort of deliberate versus emergent. Um, the direction is not necessarily conscious. We, we rationalize it afterwards, but it's the direction we end up going in is determined by the relationships we're in. And we are not, unless we take control of those, we are not in control of them. They're mostly in control of us. And that's what determines the direction the organization goes in. So some key questions about this. Um, what structural couplings are we in? What are they like? where does this relationship take us and is that where we want to go is that what is this actually going to turn us into and is that who we want to be and we very rarely step back and ask those questions seriously but from our point of view that's what strategy is about and for an organization you know most organizations we're looking at multiples of this so there's you There'll be a relationship with the market, with competitors, with partners, with regulator, maybe. There are multiple structural couplings, and our choice is to change which couplings we've got or change the nature of the coupling. And the approach I'm going to talk about is really about changing the nature of the coupling. Each of these relationships exerts a tension or a pressure on. They're all trying to pull us in particular directions. And our overall strategic direction the emergent strategy is is a product of those it is it is where we end up going in relation to those various tensions on us so our definition of this is um, strategy is about changing our fit how we fit our environment to our advantage by concentrating power in time so there's three dimensions to this fit power time and conventional strategy really only has a language of power. Um, so almost all conventional strategy is only based on the exercise of power. It pretty much ignores the nature of fit and it pretty much ignores time. If you look at military strategy, um, time is absolutely critical. Uh, but in business strategy, it's almost non-existent except as a kind of timeline on a plan. So to work with that, we break it down into a number of elements. Um, and I'm going to just take you through those. So starting with the, the fit ones, the green. And the first of those is differentiation. So basically, how different or similar are we to everybody else? And there's, we've got kind of three settings for that, herd, edge, and individual. So in most sectors, there is a recognizable herd of organizations. and you can tell what those are because they are very, very similar to one another. And they're very, very similar to one another because they copy one another. And when you're in the middle of the herd, all you can see is the other members of the herd. So that's who you take your lead off. Um, so if you think about um, uh, car manufacturers, automotive manufacturers, um, if one brings out a super mini, they all bring out a super mini. Um, as soon as they start moving into um, EVs, they all move into EVs, you know. Um, and where there's, a, where there's a herd, there's a boundary around that. So you can tell who's in, who's out. There are some players who are at the leading edge and you know who they are because everybody's following them. That's what defines a leader. There are some players at the lagging edge and you know who they are because nobody is following them. 
there are some players at the sides. So they're a little bit different, um, but nobody's following them. So if you take, again, take the car example, Subaru. Um, Subaru is different in many ways in the way they do the engineering, the way they do the styling, um, the type of engines they use. They're different to everybody else, but nobody copies Subaru. They're recognizably part of the herd, just. Uh, so they're not different enough to be totally outside, but nobody's following them. Yeah. If you think about this in IT terms, um, for a long time, we had an ecosystem that was dominated by Microsoft. So everybody was built around the Microsoft ecosystem. And before that, it was built around IBM. So you had IBM and the Seven Dwarfs. But right outside of that, you had Apple. So Apple was an individual, and Apple did everything it could to be different to everybody else. So they deliberately separated themselves from the herd. Um, they had a different business model, so they did software that ran on their heart, their software that ran on their hardware, and their hardware only ran their software, and that was a model that nobody else copied. Um, they're the only people who took styling seriously, and that all worked okay for them. Um, you know, they had a little dedicated bunch of people who followed them um, of, of consumers. Uh, particularly the design community, and it worked brilliantly for them right up to the iPad. And as soon as they developed the iPad, the entire herd stampeded over to where Apple is. And they're now kind of subsumed within the herd. Um, for Apple, they have a bit of an identity crisis now because their entire existence has been built around not being part of the herd, and they really don't know how to compete as part of the herd, which is what they are now. It's one of the perils of being too successful. So that's differentiation, which is the first of our elements. The next one is around, um, around shaping. So is this a relationship? Um, so in this structurally coupled relationship, is this a shape react relationship where one party is basically shaping and the other one is reacting? So the change is all in, in, in one party? Or is it a relationship where the two parties actually co-evolve, whereas each change, as one changes, the other changes? So is it, is it much more of a, um, an even-handed relationship? The third um, part of FIT is around stretch. So a structural coupling relationship changes us. What's the nature of that change? Is it incremental, radical, disruptive, paradigm shift, or is it basically screwing us up? We don't we don't understand what to do. Now, most of those are on a on a sort of increment of risk and reward. Um, so, from incremental to paradigm, uh, the risk goes up, uh, as does the reward if you get it right. Confound is, is slightly different. Um, so confound is where you are innovating to actually disrupt the, or not disrupt, to, to, to confuse the other party in the relationship. Time, as I say, critical in, in military strategy, not in most business, conventional business strategy. So in this relationship, who's moving faster? Is this a relationship where one party's moving significantly faster and thereby Therefore, by definition, the other's moving slower. Or is it a relationship where both are more or less moving at the same speed? And there are no rights or wrongs about this. It, it, it is what it is. There are, you know, as with the birds and the beaks, there are lots of ways to win here. If you want to change the time differential, then there's basically three things you can do. You can use foresight. So the further out you can see, the future, the longer you have got. So it's a way of actually slowing down time effectively, giving you longer to, to, to do whatever it is you need to do. You can alter the change rate. Um, so either increase the level of stretch or, or crank the handle on it faster. And you can increase your cycle time. So if you think about um, Toyota production system, that was based on single on 
massively reducing the cycle, the operational cycle time. So moving from factories where basically you had press lines set up for months with producing the same thing to single minute exchange of dyes. You could go from making a door to making a, a, a wing um, within a couple of minutes. And it dramatic, that shift in cycle time dramatically changed the economics of that industry. So those are three things to play with to alter the time dimension. And then we've got power. So the basic raw one of in this relationship, who's stronger? Is this a relationship where one party is stronger than the other? Or is it one where both are reasonably balanced in terms of power? And whatever power we've got, we have choices about how we how thinly we spread that. So is this again, is this a relationship where one is single and the other is multiple? Um, are we doing one thing? Are we doing several things? Or is it diffuse? Are we doing loads and loads and loads of things? And again, you've got choices here. Yeah. If you want to change the um, the power relationship, there's two enablers you can use. One is critical mass. So deploying enough resource to change the balance of power or agility. And I don't mean agility with a capital A in a agile software kind of way. I mean, the ability to move resources from doing one thing to doing something else and do that quickly. Um, if you can do that, then that effectively is a force multiplier. It means you can have a resource doing one thing on Monday and something completely different on Tuesday. And effectively, you, you, you can quite often double your resource, the effect of your resource by increasing the agility. That's the elements of this. And um, I think it's useful to think about this. We think about this in terms of, of weather, the differentials between different organizations are what drives the dynamics of the relationship. So the bigger the differential, the more energy there is in the system and the more dynamic and turbulent the relationship's going to be. If you're in a competitive situation, you can use any differential to your advantage. You can use being faster to your advantage. You can use being slower to your advantage if you know how. If you're in collaboration, then there's a kind of sweet spot. We collaborate with other people or with other organizations because they are different to us. They bring something different to the party. But if they're too different, it's, it's hell on earth to collaborate with them. So there's a sweet spot which is being different enough to make it worthwhile, but not so different that it's really, really painful. Um, we're a small consultancy. We've had a number of much larger consultancies come along and want to work with us. And it is usually um, a nightmare trying to work with bigger consultancies um, because we just get so frustrated with their bureaucracy and how slowly they move. And they, we, they get really irritated with us because we won't fill in the forms and um, we just you know, they like the innovation, but they really don't as well, you know. So the, the, there is a kind of sweet spot there. And I think for, for, I'm guessing for most of you guys as well, if you are doing an internal consultancy job, for example, or an agile coaching job or anything like that, um, the degree that you can afford to be different to the client is a critical one. And in, in a lot of the strategy work we do in collaboration, it's about toning down the differences. What can we sacrifice here to make this relationship work? So it doesn't, it doesn't get too dynamic and just explode um, and everybody fall out and, and um, you know, have a hissy fit. So I want to take you through a um, couple of examples. Uh, the first one's a historic one. So this is um, Honda Yamaha motorbike war of 1981 to 1983. Uh, and I picked it because, um, well, I like it. It's a good example of the of the um, of various things, not least the speed of, with which you sometimes have to do strategy. And, and I think it's also a fun one to, to sort of um, put up in front of people who are interested in agility. 
um, because this is this is engine en agility and engineering really. So um, eighty one to eighty three. Um, Honda and Yamaha, they're both parts of big Japanese Kairatsus. And the relationship at the start looked like this. Um, perfectly matched in terms of power, or more or less perfectly matched in terms of power. Um, perfectly matched, or near as damn it, in terms of the concentration of that. So um, Yamaha and Honda were max matched bike for bike, niche for niche, segment for segment, right across the motorbike range. Um, they both had roughly 60 bikes in the market. Um, and that was, that was kind of how it was. Um, if one developed a new bike, the other one would too. So they were co-evolving. Neither was particularly shaping the relationship. Um, all the innovation was incremental. So they'd done the big structural changes a generation earlier. So now they were just refining. Um, perfectly synchronized. So once a year at the annual bike shows, each of them would come along with, a, with, with sort of half a dozen new models and retire half a dozen new models, maybe 10 at maximum. And at the time, Yamaha was seen as being back in the herd with uh, Suzuki and Kawasaki and Honda were at the leading edge. Now you can see by the fact that everything else is perfectly matched, that there is no differential that would push Honda to the edge. They were at the edge because they got there first and everybody else has caught up, but nobody's actually gone past them. Yeah. At the time, um, both of these parts of Kairatsu's big industrial groups and the Honda Kairatsu um, was investing massively in cars. So it's building car factories um, in various parts of the world. So the Kairatsu war chest was being spent on that. And Yamaha saw this as an opportunity. So the Yamaha Kairetsu went along to Yamaha Motorbikes and said, um, Honda's distracted building car plants. This is your opportunity to take control of the bike market. And this is how they plan to do it. So this is the Yamaha plan. Um, critical mass. They built the world's biggest motorbike factory. And the idea was that that would give them economies of scale and that would move them into being stronger and push Honda back into being weaker. They calculated that that would allow them to shape and push Honda back into reacting, and that that would move them to the leading edge and push Honda back into the herd. And that Yamaha calculated was going to be the winning strategy because there was no way that Honda could compete against huge numbers of cheap bikes that Yamaha would use to flood the market. Didn't quite work like that. So Honda Kairetsu came along to Honda Motorbikes and said, um, obviously, we can't give you any money to fight this head on uh, because it's all being used for car factories. But losing is not an option. So you have to retain control of the bike market, find a way with no more resources. So the Honda Repost looked like this. Um, it starts with foresight. You cannot build the world's biggest motor factory without anybody noticing. So they knew what Yamaha were doing, and they watched and they waited while Yamaha built their factory and committed to building the factory and committed all their management resource into trying to work out how to make that work. In the meantime, they massively reduced the cycle time it take them to design, develop, and bring to market new bikes. And they restructured into many, many more product development teams that could design, develop, and bring to market new bikes. That meant that their change rate went up and they were able to operate much faster than Yamaha. And they moved from multiple concentration, having 60 bikes in the marketplace to diffuse. They launched 113 new models in an 18 month period. So don't forget, they've gone from maybe at maximum doing 10 new models a year to 113 in 18 months. All right. So if you think about this in agility terms, this is massive. It is not like writing software where all you have to do is write the software and then, 
you know, do um, cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. It's not just hitting a button. To get a bike in the marketplace, you've not just got to build a prototype. You've got to build every single one. The reason for, the, for it being 113 was not an accident. They did it deliberately to shatter the market structure that Yamaha's bikes have been designed for. So they took every single market, significant market niche that Yamaha had a bike for and split it in half. That's why 113. And they did that by changing the paradigm of the industry. So up to that point, if you were a biker, which I was in back in those days, um, you used to buy bikes by size. So you'd go out and you'd buy a 750cc, water-cooled, whatever. And you'd look at the manufacturers and say, you know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'll have that one. Now, what Honda did was design bikes for particular styles or particular styles of bikes for particular for tribes of bikers. So now if you went to buy a bike, Honda had built a, de a designed a bike for someone specifically like me and Yamaha had not. And they did that, of course, deliberately to screw up Yamaha. This was deliberate strategy to, to confound Yamaha. That moved them into shaping and pushed Yamaha back into reacting. So at the same time as they're trying to build, bring this huge factory on stream, which is designed to build a small number of models in huge volumes, they're having now to create loads more models. They brought out 37 new models in the 18 month period, but of course it doesn't stack up against the 113. And at the end of the period, Yamaha were left with a year's worth of stock that they could not sell. And they formally surrendered to Honda and said, very sorry, we won't do it again. Yeah. So that's, uh, you can see how um, this whole thing starts to fold. So how uh, one element changes and the whole thing starts to ripple through. We've gone from a really, really stable situation where you've got two organizations that are perfectly matched off and there are no differentials. You change one thing and the whole thing can, can flip over incredibly quickly. You can also see that this is totally emergent. So yes, Yamaha had a plan and yes, Honda had a plan. But Yamaha's plan was a result of Honda's plan in a completely different part of the business. Yamaha's plan, Yamaha fell into a strategic space that was created by Honda spending money on cars rather than bikes. So Yamaha's plan was a, was a consequence of something, nothing to do with this that, that Honda had done. And Honda's plan was a consequence of Yamaha's. So the whole thing happened as, an, as a complete accident. Bits of it are conscious, bits, bits of it are deliberate, but the whole thing is not. And where they ended up was not what anybody had planned. This is, a, this is another one. This is, um, um, this is the authority strategy. This is Gartner's strategy. So Gartner started off as a fairly standard IT consultancy. Um, so doing, you know, it sat outside of the herd a little bit. Um, it's doing one thing, basically, um, doing it very incrementally, nothing particularly interesting to look at. So the strategy started really with them developing critical mass in being able to analyze the, the IT market. And that made them stronger compared to the rest of the market. The critical move then was foresight and them doing a radical innovation, which was to understand how to use that insight that they had to actually inform the market about itself in a way that, that um, other consultancies hadn't. And then that allowed them to shape the market. So by doing the, the, um, the, the, the magic um, quadrant thing, um, they started to determine what companies bought and therefore, and would tell IT companies 
uh, software companies what they had to have in their product mix. So they start to shape the buyers and the suppliers in the industry. And the more they shape, the, the stronger they become, and the stronger they become, the more they shape. Once, once a player like Gartner is in this position, it is incredibly hard to displace them. Working this through, we've got about um, a catalogue of about 80 different strategies in different categories. Um, so competitive, growth, defensive, cat um, strategies for small organisations, what have you. Um, when we started, we kind of expected there to be more competitive strategies than anything else, because that's what everybody talks about. Actually, the biggest category we've got, there are far more defensive strategies than anything else. Um, and the second biggest category is cunning plans, so strategies of deception, particularly in the finance industry. Um, so th there are... This kind of goes back to the birds and the beaks thing. You know, there are lots and lots of ways to win. Um, and there are lots of ways to win in almost every situation that you're in. Um, there is not just just one. The, the, there's plenty of stuff to go at. So um, for us, way, way faster than doing it conventionally. Uh, we did a we did a strategy exercise with a financial organization on the other side of the Atlantic and they they've been working with um, one of the big four consultancies for 18 months on their strategy and they reckon they got further and deeper in three hours with this um, really really precise because as you go through you can plan in detail the changes you need and the metrics uh, of success works for competition and collaboration scalable from multinationals down to teams um, you can model whole business ecosystems and from our point of view it connects directly into org design and strategic risk and transformation planning and all those good things so i'll kind of stop there and pause and um open it up to you guys <laughs>